we started writing Deadly Ground in late 2013. Uh, we were writing a few different things at the time and it did go through a few variations. We tried a few different ideas, a few different storylines. With the development of the story of Deadly Ground, we went through a lot of changes. It started off a lot more of a stereotypical film noir with the, a lot more kind of cliches and pastiches and, and a lot more sharp, witty dialogue, which some of we were, yeah, you know, we were quite sad to see go, but uh, it didn't really work. And we eventually came up with this, this new, more refined, more almost sombre tone. And uh, so that took a few months to get to that point, but we were, we were happy where we ended up. And we eventually settled on the idea of Lovers on the Run, which is kind of a sub-genre of film noir. Um, with film noir, you're always looking for characters who, maybe even if, even if they are optimistic, there's something wrong, there's something, there's some kind of disaster going to befall them. In a film noir, the characters usually have to suffer in some way. It's just part of the tone. So what we were doing was a modern film noir, so it combined more modern elements, more sort of technological elements with that feeling. And we embodied that in the character of Murnau, who was this sort of former soldier and he was this unstoppable force of dread that was chasing after these two characters. So we looked at things like heat and drive for a more modern inspiration for the tone, but also Classic noirs like Out of the Past, uh, The Big Sleep and Gun Crazy were the main three that we looked at just for a little bit of inspiration with regards to who the characters were, where they were going and what kind of experience they were going to have. I suppose we had to up the game eventually. The company. We've never had a mark like this. Rick's a really exciting character to play. He's quite diverse and complicated. He's had a very tough upbringing, and everything he owns, he's had to win or steal. When we had settled on a final idea for the film, the most important thing we had to do was cast the role of Eve, and we saw a lot of different actors for that part. You want to go back to small cons at nights? Nice. No. You? Only if we get bored. You started all this Robin Hood stuff, remember? Doing something useful with our skills, making the world a better place, etc. I didn't say it like that. <laughs> okay. You mentioned celebrating. Mm, yes, I did. What were you thinking of? I have one idea. Yeah, certainly Jamie Merrows was, was a cut above. I'd actually known her previously, worked with her before, but uh, she came in and, and she gave us something that uh, that really impressed us and, and she had kind of the, the strength and also a kind of more vulnerable side and that, that definitely came across. Then Either you get fired or you get fired and divorced. Which one would you prefer? It's not even that. They would send him. Who? Who would they send? They call him Myrna. I'm playing Eve. Eve's a really cool character because she's lots of different characters in one, I suppose. Um, she's completely different from when she's with Rick, when she's really herself, to when she's with anybody else, really. She kind of chooses who she wants to be, and that's kind of fun. Working with her was great. We had, we had a, good, uh, a good chemistry, and, and we spent some time in the development of the film just kind of ourselves, you know, talking about the film, talking about the characters, just you know, bonding, I guess, and that I think that definitely helped when it came to the filming process. We were we were relaxed with each other. We we knew, you know, we we trusted each other. Yeah, I think it probably helped that we were always on the go. Um, in terms of me and Jamie, because obviously our characters are supposed to be so close, and we were around each other all the time, twenty four seven. It wasn't like really I was into film bits and then he was into film bits and we missed each other. It was really like three days of constantly. Um, being with each other, so I think that was really helpful. And we had Mark Wood and David West and Nick Chiles, so various actors that I'd met previously came in and we test them for those roles and thought thought they were they were perfect for it. Casting the role Sinclair was probably the most difficult 
as uh, originally we were supposed to be a lot older and we were struggling to find someone who who fit the part and, and could really kind of bring across what we wanted. And eventually we decided to, to change the character slightly, to make him younger, slightly sleazier and uh, and Mark Wood was, was fantastic bringing that across. He's and again he's fantastic fun to work with. What's drawn me to Sinclair to play him is obviously he's someone that's targeted by Rick and Eve. Um, maybe he is a weak link within the corporation and obviously that's why they've targeted him. But I think that Sinclair feels as though he's a little bit more important than he is. Um, and what's drawn me to this role to play him is certainly he's a lot more far removed than me. Uh, as you can see, I'm, I'm quite scruffy. Um, but he's really immaculately dressed, pristinely, you know, kept. It's good. You obviously you see these kind of people of everyday life. You know, they're maybe hiding a little bit here and there about who they really are. Um, certainly, you know, he's probably got a wife and kids, but you know, he's he's obviously when he sees Eve, he's really attracted to her, and he's thinking, you know, he feels like he can get anything he wants, women, money, no matter what it is. He feels he's got he's got that power over anyone in life. Um, and I think that's kind of shown as well in the scene with Eve, when he's like, yeah, you're, you're into me, I'm into you, let's, let's make it happen. So definitely great to be playing somebody like this so far removed from myself. Yeah, I really enjoyed working with him too. We had a great laugh and I always felt really comfortable around him and it was um, actually quite a fun scene to do, being off dressed all fancy in a um, restaurant. So yeah, it was good. We also had David West playing Mac and... Uh... Dave's a, a, a friend, so we knew he would be he would be great for the role. With some of the others, um, Nick Cheels playing Murnau, he's uh, definitely got a, a presence, uh, this powerful, powerful chin and chiselled face. So, and, and he was great to work with as well. He's a he's a good guy. The character I play is Murnau, who is a fixer for the company, which means he does all their dirty work. That involves physical violence, which he sees as a necessity. It's his living, so he does it. When people like you steal things from the company, I find you and I fix the problem. They say you should always try and find things to like about your character, and at first it seemed very hard to like Murnau beating a guy up in chains uh, attached to a concrete post. But um, I think what I found to like in him was that when the hero escapes, uh, Murnau he kind of likes that. He's not a coward. Uh, he's got a job to do, and he'd rather it was an exciting, enjoyable job. So I, I thought that was a, a likeable aspect of. He's not a coward. So we kept the cast as small as possible. Obviously, it's a short film that's quite ambitious for a short film. It does have a lot of things going on. One of the main challenges being the locations. There were a lot of locations, and it did take a lot of work to get through to all of those, including the obviously the the Danaskin railway rail yard was the key scene at the end of the film and we had to plan that in advance, we had to make a lot of recce trips with, with Steve, the DOP, to make sure we knew exactly what we were doing when we filmed there. And we filmed in an abandoned floor of, uh, of an artist facility called the Whiskey Bond, so we had complete control over the lighting and the set there, and then various other places in and around Glasgow. We had a huge amount of locations for, for a short film like this, and, and where possible we were trying to get in some Art Deco architecture as a it's a nod back to the classic style of like the 30s and 40s noir. The crew was assembled, some of them I'd worked with before, some of them were completely new. Uh, Steve Cardinal had recommended a few people from around Edinburgh who had either gone to the Screen Academy or to the Edinburgh College of Art. So we assembled a team of, of people who were fairly new to filmmaking and people who had worked on plenty of projects and I was really happy with the way everybody, everybody got on. Uh, the first thing we did was, was shoot in Regano restaurant in Glasgow and we had a very strict time limit and we had some very complicated shots to get hold of there and I was really impressed with how the crew were able to quickly kind of get into sync with each other and get the work done as quickly as we possibly could and get out of there on time and we just took it from there. We had we had some issues, we, had, we got snowed off at one point um, and obviously everything takes slightly longer to shoot than you had intended originally and when you do have three major scenes in one day, um, it's, it's a challenge for everybody, but 
nobody really complained. We just we just got on with it, and no matter how tired everybody got, we just kept on going and we kept getting the material. I think with Eve, everything really came together on when we actually began to film because such a big part of it seemed to be the costume especially when she was like really dressed up and stuff because you never wear things like that on a normal day well i don't maybe i should but, but i don't normally so um everything really came together for that i feel i remember standing outside a building actually at one point um jamie was filming a scene and i was just um waiting um to move to the next location and I just felt really utterly Eve at that one point and I was running through uh, the script in my head for the next scene that I knew we were going to be filming and um, it was just, like dark and moody and there were some lights around and I, I think the dress and everything just really, really came together for me. So that was so helpful. And our costume um, designer Fiona and our makeup artist Hannah were amazing. So they really helped that all come together for me. The actual shoot of the film was very intense. It was three days in a row, and uh, each day was a very long day. I think we went between 14 and, and 17, 18 hour day shoots, and that was, you know, that was like 18 hours of, of solid work. So, I mean, Scott, Steve and I, we still had a lot of work to do after the shoot each night, planning for the next day, and so I think we managed to cram in about four hours sleep each night, so <laughs> by the third day we were um, starting to suffer, but there's kind of an exhilaration about it, something that drives you on, and even when we were kind of running on fumes, we still, we still had the vision, we still knew what we were doing, and uh, it really helped that the entire team, all the cast and crew, everyone worked together really well, and there were never, there were never any major problems. Everyone, everyone always did what was required of them, and, and yeah, it was it was great fun to work on. Working on Deadly Ground was basically three days of madness. <laughs> uh, normally, when you do short films and stuff like that you have little gaps in between where you're not in a scene or you're not on set but it just seemed to be like constant the whole time when it running from one place to the next but I absolutely loved it I wouldn't have had it any other way at all and it was just such a great crew and such a great cast and everyone that was involved um I felt very taken care of so I really liked it it was definitely one of the best experiences of my year one of the probably most interesting scenes for me personally was uh the torture scene where obviously I'm chained to the pillar and there was, there was no way to fake that so it is literally me chained to the pillar and obviously that couldn't be couldn't be undone and redone between takes we simply didn't have the time for that so essentially I was chained to the pillar for four, four hours straight which uh, obviously helps helps with the acting gets you keeps you in the zone but uh, wasn't uh, wasn't too pleasant an experience. When Scott first told me about this uh, film noir thriller project he had in black and white, it was uh, it was really intriguing. And uh, when we turned up on the locations, it was um, they were they seemed so natural for the for the film, an old uh, dark warehouse, and then out into this rundown railway yard, which was uh, it just felt like you were in a film noir set, uh, but falling down onto railway gravel ten or thirteen times was not. Uh, a pleasant experience. Filming the scene um, in the kind of train station bit was amazing. That was actually maybe maybe my strongest kind of memory of it. Um, because you get so involved when you're outside and you can actually feel like all the elements, like the wind and how cold it is and it was freezing. <laughs> and uh, I think that actually really helped um, to get into the character and to feel like that's not a place where you were necessarily comfortable and they obviously wouldn't have felt comfortable. So. Um, I think that was really good. That was probably my favourite favourite scene to film. You know, if this is the right... It is. This is huge. I don't know what this means. The company... It's been a pleasure as always, Mac. Well, my involvement with the film, I was... I, I came in at the very last minute. I believe it was the last scene we shot. And uh, I'd just come back from doing a, a play in Leeds and I just arrived in Glasgow and there was some sort of miscommunication uh, so, <laughs> which left me standing out in the rain for a couple of hours but um, it was just a miscommunication but we all laughed about it a couple of hours later 
Um, <laughs> we were all stressed for different reasons. I think I had my iPod stolen and I missed a train that day as well. And if, I, th I think um, I've never seen our director Scott in such a zombie-like state, but uh, I, th I think we pulled through. And um, I remember one direction Scott gave me was just be good. I don't have time to give you direction. And uh, so what you see on the screen, that's called. That's because of that direction. The climactic chase in the railway yard is uh, is great fun. Love watching that. What struck me seeing it was the the quality of uh, a film noir, a black and white film. Uh, things look different. The woman's lipstick looks different. Uh, the shadows are darker, and just the amount of the amount of shadow is um, fascinating. We ended up making a film which is very very close to what we'd had in mind. So I was I was very happy with how it turned out, and even just watching the the footage back with Steve at the end of every day, we were all delighted that, you know, the story we'd come up with now existed. We had that footage, it was there, and it looked the way we wanted it to look. One of the most significant parts of the film is uh, the cinematography. The, the visual style of it is, is beautiful, and obviously Steve Cardinal brings that to life with uh, everything... Everything was always going to be black and white, not, not shades of grey. And there are certain moments in the film where things aren't maybe quite uh, quite real, but there's there's something almost magical about it, something about the, the lighting, the, the focus that, that really brings them out. And obviously it's, it's a hark back to the film noir style and with the, with the lighting, the harsh lighting, people's faces not always fully visible. <laughs> and then we began like, the lengthy post-production process. Uh, I ended up editing the film myself and then Steve did the colour grading and we brought in a sound mixer. And it has been a long journey from from the wrap through to the finished product. Just just making sure everything was right, finding the time to work on the project, make sure that the final thing is the best film it could possibly be with the material we had, with the footage, with the sound and with the music. Um, so it, it took us a long time to get to that place and then start the process of looking into film festivals and competitions uh, and just getting the film out there. The story it is quite complicated. It does require you to pay to pay attention there, just to collect all the details, and understand what's going on. Who Rick and Eve are is a bit of a mystery. They are a pair of con artists. They're a pair of the kind of thieves, grifters, and they've been together for a few years. And there's just little hints about that backstory in the film, but it's more about the present than it is about the past or the future. Everything that happens in the film is pertinent to what's happening right here, right now, with the two of them having just taken on this large job, which we gather is for something, for a Robin Hood-like reason. They're stealing information about a corrupt company so they can expose them to the public. So this is, this is people doing something good with skills they've previously only used for selfish reasons, which is something we should all try to do. But it does backfire one of the main themes of this film is the idea that no good deed goes unpunished and no matter how hard you try there are going to be consequences for every action you take in life and Murnau basically represents that kind of that kind of fate that kind of karma and the the consequences and the punishments that these characters have to face for daring to try to do something defiant <laughs>